All right, gentlemen, one word reaction to episodes one through three of Andor. Go. I'll start with you, Sam. Intriguing. All right. Okay. I'll That's be interested intriguing. to, yeah, I'll be interested <laughs> to, to hear how you go a little bit more into that. Uh, what about you, BB Nate? Uh, slow burn. It's technically a word if you hyphenate it. So. <laughs> We'd have Works. lots. Of, we'd have a whole sentence, which is one word. If this we hyphenated true. all the words, Spider Man's so. one word. Uh, but since that's one of the most used descriptions of the series, I guess I'll allow it. Um, I will go ahead and say unprecedented. What does that mean exactly? Uh, we'll explain. Um, yeah, um, I'll tell you. Oh, and that's okay. Don't enough. spoil it. It's, okay, okay. It's okay. a teaser. Um, I'll also explain why I wasn't too sure about the series after viewing the first few episodes. Why the sons were on board immediately uh, we'll with smart. it, and um, we'll also talk a little bit about Black Adam and the Rings of Power. This yes, sir. is Tatooine Sons. It's true. It's true. All of it. What is the name of the Porg on the Millennium Falcon? Force is strong in my family. What do you think his name is? <laughs> it's a big moment. I am a Jedi. Like my father before me. Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, that porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys record an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was best. Sam, you don't know words. I deal with like thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and stuff all day. You think I would deal with words? That's that's words are um, dumb. Unprecedented means without precedent. Wow, that's great! It's like when Google just—it's never the same happened thing. before. Okay, uh, without so we'll, okay. I'll explain uh, when we get to that segment mm, at the end. Right. Welcome to Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast, the only fan podcast to name a canon Star Wars creature and to be endorsed by the writer director of the Last Jedi, Mr. Ryan Johnson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we, be- he, you know, he deserves that after he what, what we're hearing about Glass Onion. Anyway, uh, we believe that pop culture is the mythology of this generation, that there is a story it is written on our souls and that these myths speak to that story. And that is why we talk about Star Wars and Marvel and DC and Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. and Rings of Power. Is that the same? Uh, is, should yeah. we use Just that say interchangeably? Lord of the Rings. It's the same oh. thing. Okay. It'd be like saying we talk about Star Wars and The Last Jedi. Yeah. The, just say Star Wars. Okay. Uh, and everything else that we love, hopefully you love so hopefully. much. I'm David. I'm the dad. Hi, dad. Hi, dad. Hello, gentlemen. I am honored to be joined every week by my two amazing sons, Shmuley Claus, Samuel the Hutt. What are you talking about? Yeah, well, not only is Rings of Power true to Tolkien's writing and lore, it's expanding on it. It's expanding it. Oh, Uh, I can hear the fanboys now. I know. Here we go, BB (laughs) Nate. Yeah, DC really needs some management. Uh, Oh, that was like (laughs) throwing some shade at Warner Brothers. More DC drama. Dad, what are you talking about? Like I said, I had my reservations about, about Andor. I know, it was great. About, <laughs> um, about Andor after we finished uh, episodes one through three, I needed to uh, take some time to step back and watch it again. So let's see if it, my thoughts change. But thank you so much for listening to the show. Hopefully you won't have to listen to this show two times, but we'd love for you to do it um, before you decide whether or not you like it. Right? Right. Or that you would, just be smart. And listen to it one time and you already figure out that it's good. If all like 260 episodes in our catalog, you could listen to all of them. No. There's, just skip Go back to episode one. There's the seriously that three many three episodes? There's that many episodes wow. um, with it. Um, we should have a big deal when we hit our 300th. We should. Maybe we can get Dave Filoni to come yeah. on the show. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's our final episode. We're just like, <laughs> mic drop. And we're anyway. signing off? Yeah, exactly. Um Thank you again for listening to the show. If you uh, aren't following the show on your podcast app, what is wrong with you? Um, just go ahead and do that. Uh, well, I mean, seriously, you're listening. So get that. Then you get updates and you know when we record. And if you don't get the update, it's because we didn't record. Which yeah, which happens on occasion. It almost happened this week. Um, <laughs> the life is busy. Yeah, it's been crazy. Um, we got a new dog. We yes, did. and of, of course, we had to keep the Star Wars theme going. So, so. his name is Rex. His name is Rex. Is it after Rex as in the Star Tours pilot I, or after no, Rex as Captain in Captain Rex? Rex. Mm-hmm. 
It could be either. Ca- Captain yep. Rex. And, and mm-hmm. since Buster was originally, see, Turbis was named after Buster. Right. But Buster was named after the dog in Toy Story. Mm-hmm. So we also have Rex from Toy Story, which ties in. Exactly. Yep. See? So. And Rexy from Jurassic Park. Huh? That's a big, t- that's the nickname that everybody's given the giant T Rex. All right. That's All right. Park, so, you know, it works. Why don't we just stop talking about <laughs> what we're talking about and talk about what we're going to talk about? Yeah. That works. Something like that. I think I got it wrong this week. <laughs> I. Anyway, it was pretty dang close. It was close so. enough. BB Nate, go. All right. Well, it wouldn't be DC without some crazy controversy, but this time it could actually mean something really important. So let's talk about all that. Hmm. Have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Yeah, I can fly. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. The people in this room, which one is A, wearing a spangly outfit, and B, not of use? There's only one god, man, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. That man has no limits. His name is Satan. His name is Sabah. That's the, the Sabacc is the game in Star Wars. But he's also the name of the Mephisto of the DC universe. Is Mephisto is in the DC universe? Basically. Is oh, it spelled man. the same? Yeah, it, I think so, actually. Really? Yeah. That's weird. But he's just a bad boy. Uh, but there's well, one thing that's dude, bugging look- me about Black Adam, and I actually haven't talked about this. Every single trailer TV spot is the exact same. Pretty much. They have the same lines, uh-huh. same music, uh-huh. and same scenes. Yeah, largely. Or There's a couple little extras in there. They're holding it back. There's for so the much movie. I don't know. So much that doesn't make sense. Like s- his story's all off because I don't know. The trailers are giving me mixed mixed signals. Like Sammy pointed out, he's in his slave clothes while he's in the futuristic water tank. But then he's in his Black Adam clothes, which just has happened when he says Shazam. But if he says Shazam, then he's going to turn into Ash because he's so old. So he doesn't have a mortal form anymore. Uh-huh. I'm confused. We'll have to yeah. wait for the movie. But I am glad they didn't reveal the whole plot. In yeah, they the haven't. That's for sure. All right. Well, why don't we talk about it? Yeah. So <laughs> earlier this week, Warner Brothers Discovery released a new TV spot for Back Adam that had some shots of past DCU movies in it, including a shot of Batflex Batarang from Batman v Superman. Mm. Henry Cavill Superman with Lois Lane, you know, kind of rubbing the symbol. <laughs> that came out wrong. That um, came out and, really wrong. And Batman v Superman, a lot of Batman v Superman. Uh, Wonder Woman from Wonder Woman, uh, Aquaman right. from Aquaman, and Harley Quinn from yeah. Birds of Prey. That's a surprise. That was interesting. That was yeah, really that was weird. Do y'all think this means anything, or just shows that this is part of the DCEU? I'll let you go first, Sam, because I have opinions, and I want to hear yours I first. You, you always I have opinions. That, yeah, I think they're showing like, look, this is the universe we're going with, and this is a part of it because without those like shots being in the trailers and stuff, there'd be nothing to tie this to the DCEU. Like not a thing. None of the other characters. Amanda Waller. Okay. Yeah. But there've been, she's been in, what about suicide squad and the suicide squad? Like those are different. They're the same universe. They are. Yeah. Okay. Well, because we had the same, you know, uh, whatever that guy's name, Rick flag. Okay. It was the same. Okay. But, other than that, there would be nothing tying this, <laughs> this to the DC to the larger DCU, and even then, that's a pretty like sideways tie-in because you're gonna go through that and then into Suicide Squad and then into the DCU. You know, like it, it feels. She's like, the Nick Fury of the DCU. Let's just be honest. She's just a bad guy, though. No, she's not a bad guy. She yeah, is an anti-hero. She ain't great. Anyway, but yes, I think that this is just showing that it's a part of DCU, and I like it. I think it's a smart decision on their part. All right, Dad, what are your opinions? I. I th- I think that they're fools if they're including all this stuff in the trailers leading into the Black Adam only to pull the rug out from underneath all of those fans of those series and have it have nothing to do. Yeah. Right. Uh, with those. That would be the, the craziest thing in the world. To it do. would be. And I don't think the way Dwayne Johnson has talked over and over and over again and about how much literally doing fan service mm-hmm. is important to him. That would be. I don't think he'd he'd stand for it. Yeah, no, he that's wouldn't. true. He's been in like part of the production since the beginning, right? And it's been years <laughs> since before Iron Man. Yeah, so it's just crazy. Yeah, so he definitely wants this to succeed, and I think he realizes that for it to succeed, it needs to be a part of the DCEU. So he's going to push for that. I think so. Um, 
But here's where controversy comes from. Originally, this TV spot, trailer, whatever you like to call it, was released with some Justice League footage. Explain for that was in the back. That's 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 Joss Whedon's Justice League version. The um, original. The no. The theatrical the version. Theatrical okay, sorry, version. you're right. Yeah, it's not the original. <laughs> um, <laughs> it had that footage in it and not Zack Snyder's. Okay. Um, instead, it, it made some fans very confused and frustrated because they had every right to be frustrated. <laughs> but pretty quickly, after some screenshots were taken, it was taken down and replaced so with the, the version Justice we have today. League version of this of trailer, trailer was taken down. It was, and it was replaced with the version we have now with a bunch of Zack Snyder stuff in it. Hmm. Even Dwayne Johnston mentioned it when he reshared the new version of the trailer with the caption wow. corrected. Okay, so you think someone kind of jumped the gun at Warner Brothers? That hmm, that is, it. it hmm. They don't do that. Not like just like on a whim, just to, that's not a fan service thing, right? You don't say, Oh, well, the fans seem to like Snyder's version a little bit better. Why don't we throw <laughs> that in the trailer to appeal to the fans? They didn't no, have there's a serious there, like business decisions that have to be made with that. That's not a small, a small, oh, I, I think that the corrected thing is the biggest issue. The right. thing that right. when Dwayne Johnson retweets it right. out and says, no, this is the right version now. Mm-hmm. Um, that tells me that he was probably pretty frustrated. I mean, about he what shared the out. original one. Did he? And then he heard everything about it and he took down his post and, you know, they took it all over and then he reshared the other one with correct. So I have a feeling because the way that these things work behind the scenes, mm-hmm. my gut is they have this some is- of these things scheduled yeah. to tweet out mm-hmm. months in advance in some yeah, cases. Yeah, that makes sense. So this could have been scheduled back before they made all these changes that they're getting ready to yeah. make. Yeah. And that got... It just was like buffered or, you know, one of those exactly. services. Yeah. It was in the and queue. It, it got up and it went and he tweeted it out and nobody realized that it was the wrong one mm. until after everybody lost their minds and then they deleted it. And Some intern corrected is it. fired. <laughs> Very much so. I that, that was crazy because I saw the trailer first and I was like, no way. It's Zack Snyder stuff. I was, I was super excited. And I saw all these people freaking out about it. Like, it has Justice League footage. And I'm like, no, it didn't. So you saw the corrected version. I saw the corrected version okay. first because I saw it like an hour after it came out. They were fast so it was in qu- getting it, was it down. It was turnaround. super quick. But, of course, people still got screenshots of it because people are fast about well, that. Yeah. But speaking of that, uh, people are theorizing that this means we will be getting some changes in the DCEU from this movie. Sort of a soft reboot. But there was also another trailer where Black Adam says... Nothing on this planet can kill me. I did hear that. Making people speculate about a possible Superman versus Black Adam. That's not happening in this movie. No, No. but do you think we will see Henry Cavill Superman in this movie at some point? Just like in it, not necessarily fighting? No. Maybe like a, hey, you need to like stand down sort of thing. I I could see it, no problem. And I think that would be super smart on Warner Brothers Discovery's part because... That will give this movie the legs it needs. That'll get the internet talking about it. Like, oh my gosh, they just put Henry Cavill Superman back in the DCEU. Oh my gosh, now everybody will go watch it, right? But that'll also kind of help, like you said, soft reboot it, Mm -hmm. tie it with a larger story, and set up a potential... Superman v Black Adam movie, which I'd be all there for. That's and exactly throw that's Shazam you, in there, right? That's what you get. You want throw from the Shazam, D- in yeah. There. So it, there yeah. was actually a, a DC showcase short. It's Superman Shazam yep. versus Black yeah, Adam. That. It's a great short. This that's what you want from the DC. You want Batman doing Batman stuff because Batman's awesome, and then you <laughs> want to see, for lack of a better term, gods duking it out. Yeah. That's what the DC is. But Marvel's, you know, it's more comic booky, you know, yeah. campy stuff. Absolutely. The DC is like you want to see Clash of the Titans on Definitely. screen. Superman v Black Adam v Shazam on the big screen would be phenomenal. Oh yeah, have them fight each other because Superman's one of Superman's weakness is second most to, weakness to car- is to magic. It. Yeah. And their powers come from magic. And so they can they could beat him. Like Shazam is I didn't known for being that. able mm-hmm. to beat him. So, All right, so I'm curious from you, BB Nate, okay. what happens when it's October 21st or October 20th? Yeah, we're seeing We're at IMAX <gasps> in Pensacola. <laughs> Whoop. AMC Bayou Theater 15. All right. We're on there. And in some way, not an end credit scene. Oh. <laughs> somewhere in there, they've added 
in reshoots a new scene that has Henry Cavill in there as Clark Kent or Superman or something like that in this movie, what's your reaction? I don't know. It's like it's like seeing you know Andrew Garfield show up as Spider Man. Really, it's that it's big. big really? Because they came out around the same time. Actually, they came out basically a year apart from each other, mm. and it's huge. I mean. We never thought we'd be able to see Andrew Garfield again. We did. And we're not thinking we'll be able to see Henry Cavill as Superman again. And if we do, that's crazy. I cannot imagine how the theater will react. That will be insane. And I feel like they have to have something like that in this movie. That's right. Because I think. you don't go to DC and you're like, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's make a Black Adam movie. Because he's not one of the most well known characters. I barely know anything he's about not him at all. I mean, I would I would really make uh, a Justice Society movie before that, or a Green Lantern movie before that, or something like a Cyborg movie before that, but hmm. not like Black Adam because he's just such a. But this is the Dwayne I, Dwayne exactly. Johnson, thing, and he right? wants this to be huge, and he keeps saying that this movie will change the hierarchy in the DC universe. That was, a, I that swear. was a really bad, Dwayne. No, I, I wasn't Johnson. doing, trying to Kind of it. sounded like you were trying. No, I wasn't. I was you just, sure? I was trying to mock him okay. because I think, he I think says Dwayne that, also just talks a big talk sometimes too. He, I think he said that in like every single post about this movie he's posted. That line is in it and he, and trailer that he's in or anything. He just says that. Are we it, taking bets though on like if Henry Cavill is in this movie, right? You know, after a week or so of it being in theaters, you know, when spoilers aren't that big of a deal anymore, he posts a screenshot of you know Superman being in the movie and then just says, you know, you're welcome or something on it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Know. I could see you doing something. I like could that. see honestly, Amanda Waller sending Superman to keep. How Black would Adam she in get? Line. Well, how would she a because in the trailer, we already confirmed that she's affiliated with the Justice League. If you look in the bottom right corner, her affiliations is the Suicide Squad, Justice League, Justice Society. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Oh, so she is the Nick Fury. You she is the Nick Fury of the DCEU. So do y'all think that this movie can actually change the DCEU for better or worse, maybe? I think they have to use this to change the DCEU. Yep. They can't continue to do what they've been doing. No, not at all. Um, and the opportunity just going to say this the opportunity is there marvel the mcu have has opened up the door yeah for the first time there looks like there's weakness in the mcu yeah it's it's like there's an opening like if nascar there's that opening (laughs) you gotta jump in there right now you know superman's been shot with the magic kryptonite bullet or something and he's weak right Mm -hmm. you gotta go after it that would work wouldn't it that would take him out That that would kill him. Yeah. Oh man, I'm smart. And I didn't even know it. Um, I don't think you want to kill the MCU though. No, I, you know what I'm saying. Though. The do, opportunity yeah. is there, and so if they do things right, they, they don't. They're never gonna. They're never gonna beat that. No. What's happened in the MCU has all. It, it's already gonna accelerate that. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, going forward, they could compete. Mm-hmm. They could with compete. the MCU. If they stay true to what DC is, this is this is the fact that the Miami Dolphins right now are three and zero, <laughs> and the New England Patriots are like zero and three or one and two or something like that. One and two, yeah, I, think. I think they're one and two. And so that's that's the kind of thing that can go forward. You're never going to take away Tom Brady's Super Bowls, no, as as a Patriot. No. But going forward, the, you can have a fighting chance. You can have a you can compete, and that's yep. what could happen here. The thing that is so important that DC really needs to focus on is the thoughtful thought provoking emotional points that they have in each of the characters story because every one of them is deeper more more commonly than than Marvel is I mean Marvel you can really see see, most Marvel comics are are very comic booky and most Marvel movies are definitely comic booky. I can't think of that many Marvel movies that go deep into. The and when they tried emotions. to do it with it feels, the, with Eternals, it didn't work. It didn't. Right. But when Daredevil does it, it works great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because it took three seasons. Exactly. To do that, so. so, but it always ma- it means a lot for DC to do that. They have to connect to that, and I feel like if they sh- stay true to that and keep that like with the Batman they did that Mm -hmm. and like what I loved about Batman Mask of the Phantasm so much is that is Mm -hmm. a big part of it and so I think they really need to focus on that I hope they do 
Yeah, I hope so too. Yes, but Black Adam uh, releases on October twenty first. That's your Papa's birthday. It is. Birthday, Papa. You should go see it. Um, so we'll have to <laughs> wait until then to see what happens. But all I can say is I am optimistic about the future of the DCU. Awesome. Mm. Good job, BB Nate. Good job, Nate. Nice segment. Thank you. Are you guys ready for this? Ready. All right. Uh, the random articles button on wikipedia um wow that took randomness to a whole new level on this week's is it canon oh geez this is not going to go the way you think okay we know how this works but for those of you that don't here's how it goes i give a description of something i found on wikipedia usually it's when i hit the random article button that first article again again Again. Mm mm-hmm Two, t- two weeks in a row. That, these two knuckleheads make an argument for whether they think it's canon or legends. All right. This one's really random. Okay. Uh, unidentified blue coral divers clan witch. <laughs> what the heck? Let me repeat that the for those that may. UBCDCW. An unidentified blue coral divers clan witch. Who? Who's here's, there? Right, here's, the okay. here's the description. Here's the description. A Dathomirian witch of the Blue Coral Divers clan from the planet Dathomir, because that's All where right. Dathomirian witches come from. Oh. Um, once traded colorful shells to the clanless witch Falta. Okay. The shells were used by Falta in the magic ritual in which she created her daughter Yena. What? Is this legends or is it canon? I'm going to have you start, BB Nate. What the heck? I feel like there was something in Dark Disciple that I might have missed. <laughs> I don't remember that book all that well. That was a long time ago. So I feel like it has the potential of being canon because Dathomir takes place in Clone Wars, which I don't remember all that much of. Dark Disciple, which again, I don't remember that much of. And not even really Dooku Jedi Lost. There's not, no real Dathomir in that book. Mm. So I don't know. <laughs> Okay, let's get Sam's I'm, opinion. I'm going to go canon just because I. This is Clone Wars, right? Maybe. Well, most likely. Well, okay, Dathomir was introduced in Clone Wars, mm-hmm. right? Okay. That was a lot closer to the Disney takeover time than a lot of other things. So I'm going to guess that it's canon because there was less time for more things to be written about this planet and stuff okay of that. i don't know I, otherwise that yeah you're kid not kid now that's random you got to give me a choice BB i'll Nate. say canon you i don't know say canon? yeah might as well really i don't know yeah i really don't know I, yeah this is from the clone wars stories of light and dark oh it is yes a let's canon go Woo-hoo. anthology based we on have. and inspired by the <laughs> animated television series star wars the clone wars it features 11 short stories from 11 authors with interior illustrations Ooh. by xenia Actually. zelenstova it was Ooh, first published in hardcover by disney lucasfilm this. press on august 25th 2020 hey all right. I mean, you guys did thing. good. I did not. Good logic Thank with you. that. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs> uh-huh. Man, people like sit there and write articles about the most random stuff. I'm here for it. It's cool. But dang, that is a deep Wikipedia deep dive, is, literally. A, is a machine and they've got millions of those articles out there right now. So everything that one was really, really obscure. That's good. All right, Shmuley, let's go for it. Yeah. Well, Rings of Power is the gift that keeps on giving. We got more of Sauron. Sorry. Maybe. I mean, the stranger that is no, not a stranger. Um, not Adar all. isn't answering any of our questions. And I mean, Sauron isn't it? No, uh, yeah. that's the mouth of Sauron. Um, and cool. Numenor finally cool. set sail for Middle Earth, but I want to focus in on something else. Not only is Rings of Power giving us a great story, but it's also giving us more history and lore, specifically about Mithra. Be on your guard. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the world. All right, then, keep your secrets. Facebook knows me too well because I got ads. Facebook knows everybody too it's well. It's a little scary. Facebook's creepy. I got this ad for like, they're the map of Middle Earth, right? But they're like high top sneakers. 
No, it looks really cool. It's like the map is like put cool. on the on the shoe or whatever, like on the okay. sides and stuff. It looks really cool, and and I'm, I kind of want. It. <laughs> and then I I found a, a special hardcover edition that's being released for uh, Lord of the Rings. Rings. Yeah, I saw that. It has. The full map, uh-huh. full size map of Middle Earth, um, some illustrated books in it as well, uh, some other stuff. Wow! And each page or most pages have illustrations from Tolkien and other people Ooh. of what he originally thought what it would look like from that page I just read. Is there, take, take a wild are, guess. I, I I'm ready for you to. I say can't it. guess because I already know. Tell me, two hundred twenty-five dollars. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> And it's all three books, right? Wow. Yep. And then some. One collection and then a bunch of other stuff. All right. Sheesh. It's worth it. We should probably talk about this. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we um, ain't getting that. All right. <laughs> One of the interesting things is we got an origin for Mithril in this latest episode of Rings of Power. And no, for you guys, it's not going against canon as Tolkien never provided an origin for Mithril. Okay. So Elrond explained that centuries ago, a great elf and a Balrog of Morgoth battled over this tree that was on a mountain that contained the light of one of the last Silmarils. Okay. As the two clashed, it caused a storm to form and lightning to strike the tree, sending the light of the Silmaril deep into the mountain and thus creating veins of Mithril. So first off, what did y'all think about this? Origin of Mithril. I need to understand origin. when you say contain the light of one of the last Silmarils, what that means. Okay, so the Silmarils were th- like, think of importance at least, think of the ring. Like they were that big okay. prior to this story taking place. They contained the light of, you know, those two trees that they showed in the beginning? Mm-hmm. They contained the light of those two trees. And they were hugely powerful, really important and stuff. And so this tree was either i think they said in the show is actually hiding one of the silmarils right and um when lightning struck it it caused the light of the silmaril or light the light of those two trees to go seep into the mountain through the roots of the tree and create the veins of mithril as we see in the show so does that kind of help it helps me understand it now let me be nate talk about what do you think what do you think about that then i'll come back i thought it was an awesome origin i mean just that shot right there is something i want to hang on my wall i want to make that my desktop because like you have you have the darkness of the balrog and then you have the lights from the the elf side and the lightning and Uh the tree everything about it is just fantastic it looks great but it was really also just it's epic and i saw somebody talk about that after this episode this episode just felt epic and it felt Tolkien in every way everything about it it was slow but it was great and it was written perfectly and some of the scenes like i thought the scene with gladriel fighting the the numenorians oh that was awesome oh, yeah it's so, so much like fun. Tolkien. i felt yeah. like i could be reading that in in a lord of the rings uh, book just mm-hmm. it was great and i think that this episode did that well and i think this origin just sealed that for me it was great i love how they're bringing in elements from the Silmarillion and some other things with it that they aren't permitted to go into super super detail with, I guess, because of the they're not. Or whatever. Yeah. If the but they're state. pulling those things in and creating their own legends. It's it's almost like you know how in Star Wars you've got those people that grew, for thirty years had this entire storyline that got set aside by Disney with the canon mm-hmm. versus yeah, legends oh, yeah. thing, and they have this. Well, the legends is my story mm-hmm. type thing. Yeah. It feels like this is almost the exact opposite. You've got the official Tolkien Silmarillion and you've got all the other stories and Mm -hmm. lore and stuff. And if you've been a reader of that, that's your official Tolkien stuff. I'm cool with that. Right. But I've never read any of that. Mm -hmm. This becomes my. My Middle Earth story, my my stuff. And I loved I loved what we saw. I Mm -hmm. thought it was awesome. Yeah. So I I guess you kind of answered answered this in that. But. It seems like you're enjoying how Rings of Power is kind of giving us backstory and fleshing out this universe because we don't have a lot of that prior experience and stuff. And even then, people who have read the books didn't get even this backstory, right? So how are, y- are y'all enjoying how Rings of Power is just kind of deepening that? Will that change the way you rewatch the movies and stuff later yeah. on? I really love the backstory we're getting. I mean, that's what I expected when it came to the show that they're planning a 50 hours of content with yeah. backstory. And that's what this show is for. It's to tell you the story of the rings and the characters behind them and everything, which is what we're getting. And I really love how they're just they're taking their time 
with all of the characters to to give them stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're having little moments here and there, but with Halbrand, we're getting to know him a little bit yeah. more just from that stuff. And I mean, Elrond has been surprisingly yeah. Explain something to me about Elrond. Okay. I got the impression from this story, especially the conversations that he was having with is it Kellen Brimbor, which one, the Smith. Yes. The Smith? Yes. Yeah. Kellen Brimbor. How's that pronounced? Kellen Brimbor. Brimbor. Okay, I got it pretty close. No, hey, yeah, you were okay. you were right on. I was right on. Okay, um, I got the impression that his da- his father was human. Oof. Uh that might be true, actually, because he's half elf. Around half elf. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. His, was, his his dad father was, was a human, was, I believe. Human. And yeah. so that when he goes to try to interact with the gods to get their help. It's that's why Kellen Brimbor was like, I knew your father. I was there when they happened. Yeah. He said he was the only one that yeah. could do it uh-huh. with it. I, I thought that was really, really yeah. interesting. I, I, yeah, you're right. He is a half elf. I can't remember if it's his dad or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's his dad. I mean, these yep. are the kinds of things that I'm getting from this that are going to change the way I watch it. The beautiful thing about this is this is episode. Is it four? I thought this was five. Or is it five? This I think this five. is five. It was, was five. five. You're right. Episode five of season one out of five seasons. Correct. Mm hmm. Uh, right. There's going to be a lot oh, of yeah. backstory and lore going into Hobbit and going into the Lord of the Rings. And if they could find a way to tie it in there without it contradicting any of that mm-hmm. or throwing that off, I think that would be tremendously yeah, I fun. just checked, and you're right. His dad is is human. So that's wow. probably why he didn't want you know his daughter to right. go to Aragorn. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about Mithril and like with the origin and stuff, but... You know, why was it considered important in this show? Well, excuse me. Gilgalad, the elven king, explains to Elrond that since the Eldar, which are the elves that left the Undying Lands, came to Middle-earth, their light has been fading since then. Now, their only options are to either return to the Undying Lands or become soulless, hus- soulless husks roaming Middle-earth. So basically mortals. E- worse. More like Nazgul. More like zombies wow. or Nazgul. Um, sort of. I, I, I'll ask you a question in a minute that might okay. be uh, interesting. But Gilgalad believes that since the Mithril contains the light of the Valar, which is that those trees, the Silmarils, stuff uh-huh, like that, uh-huh. that exposure to it would restore their light and stave off this sickness, I guess. Now, maybe this is an obvious question to everybody else, or the answer is obvious, but could this be the real reason Gilgalad enlisted Celebrimbor's help in creating the forge and why he needed Elrond involved with his connection to the dwarves. Oh, I think that absolutely the whole thing was about that. Mm -hmm. It's about the Mithril. And I definitely think that the only reason that Elrond is involved in this is because he has a relationship with Durin. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that was one of the reasons that Elrond seemed so thrown off by Mm Gilgalad in this. And it was, it was, I, I'm not a fan of the Gilgalad. No, I don't think we're supposed to be a fan of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I was led to believe, I think we probably all were, that, that it, was about, was, it was about the rings. Yeah. I guess we're not getting that for a little while. But um, now I was going to ask, could this be how the first orcs were made? And, and let me explain, because the the whole their light draining and stuff, because there's it's never been confirmed by Tolkien one way or another on the origin of the orcs but the widely accepted explanation is that morgoth took some elves corrupted them drained them of their light and, oh wow and twisted them to become the orcs mm-hmm. so could this be kind of how the first orcs are made is this how they're going to canonize for in, in a way that that is where the orcs come from and that would explain why they hate sunlight and things like that hmm. right what are your thoughts on that? That's an interesting theory. I haven't heard of it. I never really thought of how the orcs were first made. I never considered it or That's just fair. thought it was important. But I don't know. I, I think that seeing the whole idea with the Mithril and Gilgalad being so terrified of his own mortality, mm-hmm. it shows how, I guess, privileged the elves are. They, they, don't, they, yeah. don't, they don't, don't consider death. And so they're terrified by the first sign of the possibility mm-hmm. of death. And so them being orcs is possible. I'm not 100 percent sure, but hey, I'm. I think they I love be. this idea. I know. I think it'd be great. I I'd love to see Gilgalad 
becoming an orc, honestly. Oh, and Elrond ooh. having to deal with that. Turning dark. dark. Well, I think that, that that would that would turn Elrond into who we see in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. This kind of you know he's the pessimistic ruler. yeah and he's dark he's dark he is very of pessimistic. just every everything is you know like he's super careful everything is down yeah. to the t yeah and yeah. all that stuff dad i love the idea that this could be be where they go with this of course it's never been confirmed and not confirmed one talking, way or another yeah but it would be a really cool way of creating an origin it helps explain to some extent even the the um anatomy of the of the orcs because they yeah, have the, the pointy, pointy ears and and all of that um this it feels to me like this could be somebody's head cannon that's one of the writers and they yeah. came up and they like started sticking it in but if they make it work i think it would be a really cool yeah, story i mean it's not going against anything that's been set up set up beforehand in fact it would really more just like expound on it and confirm right. it so i like that idea but um you know, eventually Elrond is faced with deciding between keeping his oath to Durin or dooming his people to annihilation. Ultimately, Elrond does keep his word and he remains loyal to his friend. And fortunately, Durin agrees to help. But, mm-hmm. you know, after a fair bit of glue, of course, because <laughs> he's a dwarf. Um, but what were you thinking, Dad, when uh, there was that scene when Elrond ultimately decided with his friend, he was talking to Gilgalad or the next to the tree, he's like, no, I can't break my oath. Um, I know Nate and I were, we were actually cheering for Elrond at that moment. We were, yeah. we were rooting him on. So what were your thoughts when that scene yeah, happened? Yeah, well, it's just so there's context for that con- that question. We we didn't get to watch it together yeah. this time because of getting a puppy and then me being traveling all weekend. So I was watching this in the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport on my laptop this yesterday afternoon um, or evening. Um I thought I got the impression for just a, a few minutes that Elrond was considering Gilgalad's request. Mm-hmm. And like he was seriously taking it mm-hmm. um, like he was going to do this. And then I was like, this is bad if he does, because then he's, you know, this doesn't make any sense with the relationship right. that he has with Durin. And it doesn't make Elrond a sympathetic hero. He mm-hmm. it makes him a, her- a hero. You feel uh, he is sort of sullied in in his yeah. in his character mm-hmm. and things like that. So I love the fact that he he came back and his friendship with Durin and his word being his bond was critical. That is such an important element of a story like this. You've got to have characters that can so stand good. by their words. So <laughs> yep. I I loved this scene. Also loved the whole table stuff. That was great. <laughs> that was hilarious. That was awesome. Um, that just showed how 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 great Durin is. But I also loved. I just, I see all these people saying, I don't know how to feel about Elrond. I don't, I don't know about his character. I mean, I don't know about what? the actor they chose for him. I feel like it feels a little You're off. Crazy. I'm sitting here. Elrond's like my second favorite character under Durin right now. Really? I love Elrond. Every scene he's in, I'm always looking forward to the scenes hmm. that he is in because he always has such these meaningful conversations Wise, yeah. even with Gilgalad he's super deep in the oath that he oh, took yeah. and he was like I cannot That's break this because if I do then who am I and all that stuff I know, was and that was great. important yeah it was mm-hmm. fantastic and I love Elrond in the series and I cannot wait well I can wait but <laughs> I'm super interested in seeing how he falls into this this kind of dark place Jaded. where he just stays like that mm-hmm. consistently and, and Galadriel too I mean she yes. has, she's a person and both of them have a journey to go on it's almost the reverse of what we get with Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars stories where he goes from being super optimistic that's the way we're introduced to him mm-hmm. hopeful super optimistic restore mm-hmm. the Jedi order you know my father will come back to the light yeah. we're gonna win to we get him in the last Jedi jaded cinematic dark and people struggled with that it's the exact opposite in this series we get a jaded dark cynical oh, mean, elrond yeah, and okay. galadriel and now we're going back and we're seeing mm. them in that hopeful youthful yeah. approach and people are struggling with that as much in this series yeah. as they did with the different version exactly. of luke skywalker so yeah that's a great point um now i thought I mean, y'all might have thought this too that this kind of would have been the event that caused the fissure between the elves and the dwarves because right? there's obviously some tension later on in the story um i thought that uh, during or Elrond breaking that promise would be it but if that isn't it then what could it be because we've we've kind of dodged that bullet a few times already in this series. i'm still a firm believer in 
the dwarves helping creating the rings can become a problem for both of them to be a later see a later in the series hmm. uh, moment. and and the elves not taking blame and putting it on the dwarves and then them all just kind of hiding away in the mountains and all that i think it's going to be super sad when that happens yeah. but, um, i don't trust gil gil i don't so i, don't I think that that's a big part of what we're gonna i see. think we might, i don't know how whether or not durin and elrond their relationship is fractured we're going to see the re- the fracturing of the the relationship between the elves and the dwarves even further mm-hmm. and so i think that that's what what it could end up being it seems the most likely to me yeah so. yeah well i love how this show is fleshing out the backstory and lore behind one of the greatest stories of all time so we can enjoy it even more um rings of power has been fantastic so far and i really can't wait i mean like nathan said i can but i can't wait to see what comes next (laughs) awesome good job it was a good conversation i enjoyed talking about that that was awesome and i'm glad we got to talk about lord of uh, of the rings well rings of power specifically Mm. within lord of the rings within yes yes Um, because we hadn't had a chance to do that no so that was fun it's good all right what you just heard on the show is like every moment that we're together yeah off recording that's basically our lives basically yeah so (laughs) that's why we started this show anyway um all right um let's talk about some movie stuff so maybe smiling uh but it isn't the those counting the box office take uh we'll discuss all that means next on movie moments at last we will reveal ourselves to the jedi at last we will have revenge all right (laughs) um Smile. I don't think many people are going to be smiling watching this movie. Um, but <laughs> S- Smile is releasing this week. Uh, it's about the description. After witnessing a bizarre traumatic incident involving a patient, Dr. Rose Cotter starts experiencing frightening, frightening occurrences that she cannot explain. Rose must confront her troubling past in order to survive and escape her horrifying new reality. <laughs> We were, we were just talking about the uh, MLB marketing campaign yes. where they had people placed in the stands this last weekend yeah. uh, with those smiles sitting mm. there and people like waving their hands in front of their faces and nobody's budging and moving. It's and great. It, it is creepy just seeing that. It's almost enough to get me interested. Just the fact that they're willing to go yes. that far to, to promote it. Uh, the director is Parker Finn. The cast is Sozie Bacon, Jesse T. Usher and Kyle Gallner. The studio is Paramount. It is rated R for strong violent content and grizzly images and mm. language going yes or no no no, no it's no, that's not our thing we're not gonna um, do it it's hor- horrible uh, <laughs> uh-huh. this next one did you see the trailer for that yet i did what'd you think about that eh. what what movie knock, knock at-, at the cabin okay a new m night Shyamalan movie um, normally that makes me excited because he's a genius i mean we can't deny but genius the- sometimes turns to crazy it does <laughs> Mad and scientist? it feels like after what, what let's see when when did this start I feel like after Glass is kind of when he started going downhill. Okay. Mm. I thought you liked his last one that he did. Old? It was okay. I I enjoyed it watching it in theaters. Okay. And then I decided, let me watch it at home again and see if it's Not the same good. thing. Not nearly okay. as good. I I just, I don't, he's gone off the, off the deep end, I think. Okay. I think he's just started, you know, it sucks. But, <laughs> hey, we have other movies we can watch. But for box office results, uh, Don't Worry Darling... 19 million. It's in the thir- 30s on Rotten Tomatoes and the ratings yeah. and stuff. It's bad. Um, the Woman King, Sam and I can vouch. You guys saw it this weekend. Really good movie. It was actually pretty good. What did you guys What did you guys think? Uh, I mean, we were we were interested from the start, but it exceeded both of our expectations. Yeah, I remember like the credit started rolling. I looked at Sam and was like, that was great. <laughs> yeah, it was really That's awesome. We were, we were just shocked. It, it came in with 11 million domestic in its second weekend, which is yeah, that's not horrible for that kind of movie. Um, and Avatar first re-release weekend only in 3D, which I'm surprised it pulled in 10 million domestic for just being in 3D. Okay, that is surprising. Um, because you didn't that kind of give medical problems the first time it came out in 3D. Did. People, People had like seizures. And yeah, so and that was an interesting marketing choice. decision. Well, I but, think 3D technology's got gotten better since then. i think so as well and they also changed the dynamic range it's in it's in 4k now so that might have helped a little yeah, bit too. Okay. smooth things out. um but we gotta see that too and we gotta see, see how they run at some point we, uh, we want to see those if we have time to go to yes. movies we'll try to do that yeah good we'll, segment can we talk yeah, about maybe. some star yes, wars now since this you know originally started as a star wars oh it podcast. did i don't know why you moved the star wars stuff to the end i did because that's what you know it, you know saved the best for last and you're so humble about it, too. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about the content. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Andor, uh, when we first finished our initial viewing of the of episodes one through three last Wednesday, mm-hmm. 
uh, Shmuley and Nate, Samuel Hutt and BB Nate, um, they were already sold. They yes. loved it. They thought yep. it was awesome. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Loved it. I wasn't. Um, I kept you myself. Were tired. I, I was tired, but I kept it cut to myself. I didn't like go venting all over social media about it like wow. other people sometimes huh. do. Um, I let myself process. Uh, so let's discuss why along, um, I felt this way, along with whether or not a rewatch of these first episodes changed anything for me. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Rebellions are built on hope. Force is with me, and I am with the Force. If you live long enough, you see the same eyes in different people. Alright, I, I, oh, I say I'm gonna go broke, but I had the chance to go broke and I didn't. But you had could, a chance to buy the like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, but Lego. I just couldn't justify spending almost a grand on Legos, so I did, yeah, made I did the that. responsible decision. But they just announced that they're coming out with along that same series, Razor Crest. So That's pretty awesome. cool. <sighs> If you do I, I, Boba Fett's ship that way, if they did it that oh, if they, way, I would not. I would buy it in a heartbeat. Really? I wouldn't consider. I wouldn't think Slave twice. One? Yeah, yeah, Slave One. If they did a collector's series, yeah, it's, I'm buying okay. it. Yeah, in the cart right then. All right, awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about Andor here. Totally different timeline. Yeah, just a little bit. But Boba Fett's alive. Yeah. You think we see him as a series villain? That would be cool. no. Um, well, that would be cool. All right, you guys already gave your one-word reactions yes. at the start of mm-hmm. the show um, to this, but let's go in a little bit more detail, explaining what you mean, BB Nate. You said it was a slow burn. What yes. do you mean by that? That was like a lot of people are saying slow yeah, burn. Yeah, it, it, it didn't have a lot of action sequences. It wasn't fast-paced. It was very methodical and slow and let the characters breathe and the story develop and everything kind of just just flow a little bit smoother and slower which i like i like slow movies and and tv shows i don't know why but i just i get drawn to those more because it has more plot and so i was super excited to see a slow burn show for star wars and honestly felt like the first three episodes were one episode yeah the pilot of this, which was okay. fine by me, like and I'm glad. Movie. I'm glad they didn't release the first episode. It would have been a, a hard thing. For it would have been to difficult. Handle. It would have just been like, what was that? All right, yeah. Because these first three episodes set up the series, and they yeah. set Flow the table. Well, well, let's and talk a little bit about that, Sam. You said it was intriguing. Explain. Yeah, I mean, I loved the perspective we got in these first few episodes. One of the things that I love to see in stars and we don't get much of, but I love it when we get it is seeing the everyday man's experience in Star Wars. Right. I mean, you'd think that'd be super boring. Why would you want to see like an everyday life in Star Wars kind of thing? But I thought it was fascinating seeing people go to work every day and, yeah, you know, hang out at the bar or what their houses looked like and how they had, you know, knickknacks and stuff. How it's like, it's not all it that It did different. feel very bad to Galaxy's yeah, Edge. It did. The I marketplace felt that. like that. I thought that was super cool. But on top of that, it's darker. We saw that from the very beginning of the first episode. It's a darker tone than what we've gotten in Star Wars before. What do you mean by darker? Are you talking about what, what Andor does or everything that happened before that? Yes. I mean, the Okay. Where he goes, what he ends up doing, because he got he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people and made a mistake. Um, and the rest of the show, you know, they're they're sitting there. He's changed his name. He's in hiding, and it, it's just a darker, grittier feel than what we've gotten before. Just he's just trying to scrape by, and he's just he's just not going well for him. The cards are not in his favor. Um, so I I like that. It's not you know, Star Wars is is has been previously very lighthearted or or you know, not necessarily lighthearted, but a lot lighter of a tone. More of a Flash Gordon serial yeah. than most stories. Um, yeah. And I don't want stars to stray from, yeah, it's for kids. We don't want it to be Blade Runner. No. No. It it's still should be able to be watched with your kids, which I still think this series was. There's definitely some darker tones. I mean, maybe wait till they're a little older, but it's not like you couldn't show this to your kids. But I don't mind them giving a little more, for lack of a better term, meat to it okay. as well. That's cool. I said it was unprecedented. A lot of what you just talked about were reasons why, but this one, the music didn't feel like Star Wars. The, I liked it, but it was different. No, it, I didn't say I didn't like it. See, every time I say that this is different, I get accused of saying I didn't like it. Yeah, what I'm saying like is it? it's very different. Yeah. It was very different than anything. I mean, it was even different than Rogue One. 
Mandalorian was pretty different too. It was musically. It was very different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, but it still felt like star Wars. I, I mean, you, you were like in the middle of a star Wars series That's with fair. Mandalorian with Bo- book of Boba Fett mm-hmm. with everything that we've done. Mm-hmm. This one, I've heard it described that if you didn't know it was Star Wars, you didn't know who Cassie and Andor was, and you just turned on the show, mm-hmm. it's a it's a really interesting sci-fi story, but you don't mm-hmm. really realize it's Star Wars. Okay. I mean, I can I can sort of see that. I if you if you tie Star Wars to being lightsabers and Jedi and Sith. Yeah, but Rogue things. One didn't have that. It still felt like Star Wars. It did have lightsabers. It did have some. And with the, well, you, but you also had the crutch of the rebellion. The Death Star. The Death Star. The Empire. Yavin 4. You know, things like that. And even in and the, the Force. beginning. And the Force. Stormtroopers to tie it into that. Right. That's my point, though. It that it you don't have those anchor points in this story and at this point, at this time. You don't have those anchors mm-hmm. to say this is my Star Wars. It felt very, very different from that. I think that's part of the reason, too. Not saying that you didn't like it because of that, but that's part of the reason why I liked it. I like getting away from that side of things because that story and that and those concepts and themes have been explored. Pretty much in everything so far, right? I, I'm not asking for concepts and things. I wanted to see a stormtrooper. I wanted to see the Empire. I wanted to see something in this story that made it feel the the corporate security forces could have been corporate security forces in any other universe. Verse. It doesn't tie in. You don't hear about the Empire or the Emperor in this. You hear about some Imperial stuff. They're thrown in like three times. The the word Empire or Imperial yeah. is thrown in. Outside of that, you don't. You don't know where this this fits um, in the in the Star Wars universe. I I y'all talk a lot, <laughs> but I I understand where where Dad is coming from. I get it, but I think that Star Wars isn't confined to lightsabers. Star Wars is not confined to the Skywalkers. Star Wars is not confined to the Force. Or the Star Wars. I'm not asking for the I'm Skywalkers, saying, but would you let me lightsabers or the Force? So. Yeah, I get it, but you're keep interrupting. Okay. I'm saying okay. you're you're all talking about how it, it didn't mention the Empire, and I'd love for it to to go back to what it feels like at Star Wars, unless some indication of it's Star Wars. It is Star Wars. You can't deny that. You look at Mandalorian and you're like, okay, yeah, this this could be Star Wars. But you look at any of the books that say say look at the the Solo book that we listen to the the Kira and Solo book. I mean, um, with it has the Empire, but that can be pretty disjointed from Star Wars. It's more about him working with okay. Kira. That, but you still and consider that Star Wars. I think, yeah. Be, so this is following a character in the world of Star Wars, not following Star uh, Star Wars with a character. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're seeing it through Andor's eyes. The Empire hasn't noticed Andor yet. They have no reason to look at Andor, but there was a rebel incursion for a private corporation, a security force, the then Empire that's going to be something, okay. and it also tied so well into Rogue One. I, I'm sure you talk. Do you talk about the stuff at the end and the line that the one of the soldiers says? No, I'm not sure what I we're talking about. I don't know. I don't. I want. I don't want to step on your your no, topic. Go ahead, but it was like it. the p- most. It was when the, they blew up oh. the ship, and the guy's like, "It's it's an incursion. They're they're everywhere." Okay, yeah, and I'm that, like, "Yeah, that's tying into Rogue that's One." That's Rogue One. You're right. You're that's right. exactly right. what Cassian said, and that's what Felicity, what what uh, what Jin, Jin said. Or so, yeah. mm-hmm. She she was like, make you know, make one soldier or ten soldiers ten, feel like a like hundred. Yeah, and it was two people, and they thought they were everywhere because <laughs> of one explosion, and then because they were they were sh- making a vehicle drive through it, and then they went the other way. So many things happened. It did. You're right. That's Star Wars, and that's Andor. Yeah. One thing that I think. Star Wars does so well though is its aesthetic. You recognize the Star Wars aesthetic immediately. Yeah. You know, everything's kind of dirty. It's lived in. The technology doesn't look very advanced. You know, there's weird parts and wires and stuff hanging off of everything. It gets the job done, does things that things we, you know, we can't do, but it looks low tech. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. and they matched that aesthetic very well in this series as well, which I give the writers. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about some specific things within it. We could do this probably for two hours, um, (laughs) talking about this, but, um, a few points that I want to have conversation about. There are two different plot lines, 
uh, going on in these first three episodes. The first one is um, where we we kind of expected um, we would see this with Cassian getting into trouble that led him to Luthen Rail mm-hmm. um, with this. But then the other one is a series of flashbacks where we see a band of kids working together to survive on Canari. Um, and now in this, Cassian is much older than six years Mm -hmm, old in these flashbacks. So it seems whatever happened that he references in Rogue One about I've been in this fight since I was six years old, that's already happened. And I think it's what led to these kids living on their own. Because did you guys take on the idea that there isn't a single adult with them? What if, just I I don't know if you asked this question, but like what if their parents were the adults working in the mine and they all died. Yeah, I think there's something like that. I mean, the official story about Canari is that it's forbidden due to a mining disaster, which, again, you talk about the ending of of the first step of first arc, the Mm. season uh, episode three and tying into Mm. Rogue One. This is the same way Jeddah is misclassified in, in, yeah. um, after the Death Star destroys mm-hmm. it. It's like an accident, right? Um, so this could be an indication of something a little bit more sinister on that. Nate, do you think that uh, we learn more about what happened on Canari throughout I, the series? I think so. Um, what was what was Cassian's mom's name? In this one? Yes. Marva? Marva, yes. I feel like she knows more about Canari then she's then, then she's letting on i mm. think she knows what happened there that she has not told cassian to i don't know spare him some pain or something but there's something more there that she knows and it wouldn't surprise me if at some point she does tell him what happened or he finds out trying to look for his sister i okay. mm-hmm. that would be i think we definitely learn more about because okay. they, they don't just have that there there's something more to that all right yeah. so, so I mean, the, he was just bringing up her sister the entire series begins with cassian looking for her her name's carrie mm-hmm. um things go very south very quickly at that point <laughs> um and it feels like that quest is pushed aside in the story here um at this point could we see that come back soon i think we have to um you know i think Cassian's going to go along with um, Luthen for a bit to kind of get back up on his feet. But once Cassian is like, all right, I think the heat's kind of died off. I'm in a place where I can do my own thing now. I got to go look yeah. for my sister again. I think that's what's going to happen. But then Luthien's going to be like, look, you've got a bigger fight right now with the rebellion. Cause that's ultimately what Luthien's going to try and get Cassian to jump in on. He's going to be like, look, you've got a bigger fight to deal with right now. Why don't you focus on that? And it's going to be this decision he has to make. It would be terrible if she became like a stormtrooper or a general in the empire or something. Jeez, oh, that would be, be Nate's going real dark, <laughs> but that, that kind of happens all over Star Wars. It does. Wars, so. <laughs> uh, but when Luther starts trying to recruit Cassian, um, he references the death of his father, um, Clem Andor, played by Gary Beadle. We only see Clem very briefly um, as his um, with his wife um, and Cassian's adopted mother, Marva. Mm-hmm. Um, rescue Cassian uh, from Canari on mm-hmm. that. Um, so he had sort of is like an adopted father, right. is who Clem is um, in this. Luthen says they hung Clem in the town square. Uh, yeah. on Ferrix. Sam, do you get the feeling that the Andors, meaning Marva and Clem and of course you know, mm-hmm. Cassian, are more focused on fighting the Empire or looking out for themselves? Hmm. Yeah, I get more of the vibe that they just kind of want to lay low and just live their lives. Um, y- you know, I mean, they definitely aren't fans of the Empire. We can get that from the flashbacks, but I, I think there's a lot of people who aren't fans of the Empire and stars. I think you know, ninety percent of the people who live in the galaxy aren't fans of the Empire, but most of them don't do anything about it. They just want to, they just want to go about their lives, live and be and let live. That's, yeah. Let's just be honest. That's what a lot of us would do too. Um, so I think they're just more focused on getting through the day without ruffling any feathers. Mm-hmm. Okay. BB Nate, why do you think Luthen is so committed to recruiting Cassian uh, to his cause? I wouldn't be surprised if if Luthen knew Clem in a past life or something. I, it wouldn't surprise me because he knew Cassian so well. And it, that's mm. not something you just look up on a well, file. There was personal connections there or something that happened between them or maybe he knows Marva or something. There's just, I don't know. It, it, it just felt off. Something about it felt just like it ha- mattered. I don't think that what was, what was her name? Bix? Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know if she would have said who was, he, who he was buying from in her message why would she mm. you're you're buying from cassie and andor and then oh yeah let me look well, no, up but then it's set up throughout the entire episode all three episodes that 
Luthen that that Luthen has been wanting to connect with Cassian. Exactly. Okay. So there's right. something there that he knows, and okay. he was he jumped on the opportunity okay. to buy this this object. So. I'm super interested in seeing where that goes and how he knows, but I'm sure he knew Marva or maybe Clem. Okay. Uh, I will come to, we'll talk about B here in a second, but before we do that, I want to get your thought on this, like corporate security, this Corsac mm. force. What were your thoughts on them and how they kind of, uh, who they are and the, and the, the uh, you know, the main two guys, mm. the guy from God, uh, uh, from the Batman mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and stuff guy. like that. Yeah. I, um, I was admittedly a little confused as to how, how they worked at first. I thought maybe they were the police for the Empire, but uh, Dad was saying they're more of a of a you know contracted security yeah. force, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. I like it; it makes sense. It's a start where there's contracted security, paramilitary in the real world. Why wouldn't there be in Star Wars? Yeah. Um, as for the characters, I like them a lot. I like you've got the guy from the Batman who is. All in on the cause. I yes, mean, he is. He is as it, as he drunk the Kool Aid as hard as you can, and then you got the other guy who is obviously like very dedicated. He wants to do the best job he can, but he's not naive. As naive, and, and he doesn't want to do things the way that it's always been done. You know, mm-hmm. he's like the corruption. What about the the like the superior the chief that, that leaves? What'd oh, in the beginning, him? yeah. I like. I mean, I like that. It fits the whole empire vibe you know yeah. they're, they're corrupt they're like yeah you know we want to maintain a good image so why don't you just sweep that under the rug but i got the feeling that he didn't want the empire to know what was going on because if they've empire found out that they were having all these problems mm-hmm. the empire is going to move Step in, in. Mm-hmm. Uh, even, well yeah but more uh, absolutely that but yeah. like that's the empire does stuff like that too i mean it just it cements that these are not good exactly. people in, in star wars hmm. so that's interesting bb nate yeah, what did you think i thought they were great um antagonists for this first arc they're they're small enough to kind of give this andor a little little push mm-hmm. and i'm sure they'll be in more of the episodes but and then the empire is going to be the main problem for him um i do have to say one of the best parts of this episode was the whole all of the civilians you know banging, banging on and stuff and marvel's little intimate oh, reckoning yeah. speech yeah. Reckoning, yeah. and then she's the worst like, part the worst part's when it's yeah, when it's yeah, silent yeah. because and then she's they're like why and she doesn't respond. Uh, it was great. That's fantastic. That's that's such a a good line. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Fit well, you know that uh, the the main guy um, in that mm-hmm. he's uh, in the in corsac what? in the corsac guy. Okay, corporate security guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember his name off the top Me of my neither. head right now because I haven't slept in. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, he um, he's one of the main stars in this series. Yeah. Uh, so yep. I, I, they're going to play a major role the, in the yes. future of at mm-hmm. least this season um, with it. Do you think that he's sort of the primary villain that they're going to let us see Andor's uh, move into the working with the rebellion from that perspective or I think so. Yeah. I mean the, the main course that guy, I don't think he at the beginning was fully bought in to their, to the mm-hmm. I guess dogma of their, of the Corsac, but after he sees Cassian do some pretty terrorist stuff, you know, he blows them up with a imp- improvised, you know, mm, explosive ID, yeah. and stuff. I mean, it's some pretty dark stuff. Yeah. I think he's going to be like, all right, whatever it takes. I don't care anymore. These guys have to be stopped and he's going to be fully bought into the bad Yeah, guidance. definitely. Well, we can't ignore B. No. Yeah, best no, character in the B was episode. great. Let's keep it real simple. Um, I, I, I'm, I and I know I'm not the only one because Star Wars Explained did a video about it that somebody talked about today. <laughs> um, but I said this pretty early on. Am I the only one who thinks that this that uh, B's personality is oddly similar to uh, that of K2SO? It definitely is. I think that just he the reprogramming that he put in K2 was to make him like B because he loved B yeah. so much. I don't think it's B like no. plugged into K2SO, but it is a it's like a more confident, cocky. Yeah. B basically. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, there was one other thing that was a couple of things, but one primarily that was pretty, um, new precedent set in star Wars. So mm-hmm. let's, yeah, let's talk about that for the dad moment. I am your father. Uh, George Lucas has uh, been on record for more than four decades now. Yeah. Um, stating that star Wars is for 12 year olds, mm-hmm. uh, that Andor took one giant leap for star Wars kind of way. Uh, from this in the second episode of Andor, or third episode, I guess it was the last episode of Andor. Um, okay. 
Um, Star Wars has had always kind of had its own vocabulary, mm. especially when it comes to cursing. Um, we joked about that on this show lots of different times. Kind right. of had some fun interactions with Pablo Hidalgo when he was able to actually interact on Star Wars <laughs> uh, more consistently with this, answer questions and that kind of thing. But that changed um, when one of the blues, one of the corporate security officers, uttered Star Wars's first real world profanity hmm. uh, in this episode and uh, I was having dinner with a friend Saturday evening discussing this he remarked that this uh, isn't that big of a deal if it fits in the context of what's happening mm-hmm. uh, with this and I assured him he hadn't seen this yet um, okay. with this but I assured him that it does it fits within the context of what's happening in that moment um, with this but then I hedged that just a little bit by saying that just because it fits the context of the story doesn't mean that it fits in Star Wars um, and I know that this will be the minority position on this but it does feel like something of the innocence that makes Star Wars special was lost by including this profession Profanity um, in it, and I'm not kind of sure, I'm not sure we're ever going to really have Star Wars be able to look back from this. So mm-hmm. a little bit disappointed um, with that. I know some others were as well, but um, when the screeners were sent out mm-hmm. um, to those uh, in the press and and other shows that get screeners, which hi hi, we'd love to be <laughs> one of those. We would those love shows, to be please. one of those shows. We just always throw that out there. Um, uh, the, it, the screeners included episode four. Um, along with what we've already seen and what's mm. already been released mm-hmm. on this. And right now the buzz is that this next episode is the best of all of the four mm. um, with nice. them. So uh, we'll find out tomorrow. Nice. Awesome. On that. Well, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to watch it, even though I won't be here. You guys, <laughs> you guys are on your own. You watch it when you can. All right. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything else? Yeah. Marvel's Werewolf by Night hailed as a spoiler. Surprisingly violent Ooh. MCU monster mash, which yeah. I kind of got that vibe from the trailer. I did. It's bizarre. I, I read some of the other reviews, and people are like, "This is this is like classic Universal monster." That's a good black and white. Well, it's, horror. It's, I think that'll be a cool like, addition. It's great. To the they MCU. said it's they said it's a lot of fun. It's it's one of the best things MCU, and they said it, it feels like the MCU is on the right track now. Okay, again, Mobius so it'll kind of be like along the lines of like Frankenstein. Stuff it will like be. That. They say it's completely Frankenstein, different from money, what they're like. It's Dracula. completely different from what MCU has done. Okay. But it, it it works. It feels I'm all right good. with yeah. that. Awesome. They'll say Michael Giacchino did a great job directing oh, he, for his first. His oh, first that's right. He's the director. Did he do the soundtrack? I'm sure he did. Uh, be, that wouldn't surprise me. But cool. next, go Michael. Kind of staying on the monster track. Uh, Warner Brothers announces Constantine sequel with Keanu Reeves. Finally, they've been wanting for years that for people have been wanting that to happen. Was the first one okay? I don't know. It was. Seen people it. said it's amazing. I've heard it's fantastic. Huh. And Constantine's really really interesting character. Everything I've seen him in, he's isn't he like a demon hunter he is he's banned from both heaven and hell so he's on eternal existence on earth oh yeah because he's he's so mischievous it's weird all right interesting james earl jones um the voice of darth vader he's stepping back from voicing star wars uh darth vader forever now oh Uh, it's being reduced to voiceovers or uh the ai stuff that they used in um what did they use that in in um, Uh, kenobi Kenobi. the kobe one it works well in kenobi it did they did well. That's sad, but it was inevitable. Yeah, I mean, he's ninety-one years old, so Jeez. give the guy a break, okay? Let him let him take a vacation um, at this <laughs> little point. summer vacation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think I'll do it. I think yeah, good job, guys. Thanks for Thank listening uh, to all of you listening right now to uh, Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast. We really do appreciate it. If you had a good time listening, it would be awesome if you could share this with your friends. Yeah, and uh, of course, the show is only a small part of the Tatooine Sons world, so be sure to like us on Facebook and join our Facebook discussion group, and then you can follow us on Twitter to get in all on all of the action. You got uh, it. You got it? Yeah. yeah, it's been a long day. Uh, keep up to date on everything we've got going on at TatooineSons.com. That's right. Don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss our next episode coming out next week. Next week. Next Tuesday. Yeah. Just what like today's about? Tuesday. Really? Yeah, that's the way it's oh. supposed to be. Um, and then give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever podcast app you prefer. We would really appreciate our it's, review. It, it helps us. It does. It makes it, us feel good. It does. Absolutely does. Thank you so much for those of you that have done that. Uh, we yes. appreciate it. All right. Uh, anything else you guys would like to say? May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Always. This party's over. I like that monkey. Get technical with me. Joy, please.